Welcome back to The Ultimate Guide to Dealing with Fear, Part 2. Make sure you go watch Part 1, where we laid a lot of foundation. Otherwise, let's crack right into it. Firstly, I want you to recognize that without fear, you'd be dead. You wouldn't be alive right now without it. So appreciate that, because it's easy to fall into the sort of trap of thinking that fear is bad and fear is evil. You start to demonize fear, and you start to try to reject fear but really, you have to appreciate that fear is there to serve you, to help you to be here right now. You couldn't be here to pursue awakening or spirituality without fear. Fear is necessary for base survival, and everything else is predicated upon base survival, you being alive. All of your spiritual pursuits, they couldn't work otherwise. But, of course, there's also a way of living life beyond fear. So what we're interested with our work here with Actualized is we're interested in not just base survival. For that, you don't need to watch videos. You can just go and do base survival. There's people all over the world doing base survival. You don't need to be educated on how to do it. You can go grab a gun. You can go rob people. You can go manipulate people, you know, whatever you got to do to survive. But but here, of course, with our work, we're interested in, in going beyond basic survival. So this is where things get interesting. Also, I want you to recognize not to fall into this trap of uh, blaming other people for being afraid of things. As you go through life, you will encounter many people who are afraid of many different things. Some of these things you'll think are silly and ridiculous even. you know, How could that person be afraid of that? Uh, it doesn't make sense to you, but recognize that this is all relative. What you're afraid of is relative to what you identify with and also relative to how you were raised, what part of the world you're living in, what kind of environment you're in, what kind of situation you're dealing with, what kind of upbringing you had, what kind of parents you had. So based on all of these factors and many more and based on your genetics and on your personality and on a million other factors, uh, yeah, people can believe in some silly things. And the reason that is, is because there's no such thing as like a legitimate fear versus an illegitimate fear. It's relative. It all depends. And what I want you to notice, furthermore, is that whatever you fear is generally completely irrelevant to somebody else. Notice that. For example, what's the greatest thing that you might fear in your life? If you're a parent, that's probably the death of your child. Makes sense. But also notice that I don't fear the death of your child at all. Likewise, you probably don't fear the death of someone else's child at all. You don't even think about it. Yet when it comes to your child, you're so concerned about it, it keeps you up at night. It terrifies you, you have nightmares over it. How can this be? Well, of, of course, precisely because the very nature of fear is to be completely self-biased. Go check out my episode about self-bias, where I talk about that in great length. But see, this is how selfishness operates. It's not interested in what's true, because if, if the fear of your child's death was actually true in some deep sense, then everyone would fear the death of your child. But nobody does except you. How can that be? Because the fear is completely relative to what you identify with. You see, notice that. It might seem like this is sort of obvious stuff. It might seem like, well, like, so what, Leo? Who, yeah, of course, I fear my child's death, but other people don't. So what? Not so what. This is a very important fact about your fear. It tells you something that about your fear that you, that you don't recognize, which is that your fear is basically imaginary. You're projecting that onto the situation. It's relative. Speaking of, of ridiculous and relative fears, uh, there's a funny story I remember. When I was a kid, I was maybe 10 years old, and my grandmother, who, who's passed away since then, um, I mean, now she's passed away, but 
But back then, this was like maybe 20 years ago, uh, even maybe 25 years ago. Uh, she would come and visit us and she would stay at our house. Uh, and a couple of times this happened. And when I was a kid, I had this I had this favorite rubber snake toy that I got like at school somewhere. I forgot where I got it. It was a very lifelike snake, um, but still sort of cartoony. It wasn't too lifelike. You could tell it was obviously not, you know, you would never confuse it with a real snake. But it, it had this really cool like rubber material that it was made of. So it was very lifelike when you wiggled it around. Again, in sort of a cartoony way, I guess it was almost an over-exaggerated version of a snake. And some some reason I was playing with this thing, and I discovered that my grandmother was just deathly afraid of these snakes. She had a, like a, a terrible phobia over it. And whenever she saw this rubber snake that I was playing with, she would just freak the fuck out <laughs> if she was in the same room with that thing. I found this so amusing. And of course, it, it you know, I couldn't understand how anyone could be afraid of this thing, because I to me it was a toy. And of course, this goes to show the relative nature of, <laughs> of fear. But she was so afraid of it that I would love, my favorite thing was to play this gag on her when I would, I would sneak this snake into like her bed <laughs> or into the toilet <laughs> or other places in the house where I knew she would be and she would kind of like <laughs> find it there. Uh, and she, when she found it, she would just start screaming and just like hitting it with a pillow. Like she would freak out like it's a real snake. And I just found this to be so ridiculously amusing this was like my greatest amusement was was tricking her with that snake because it didn't make sense to me how anyone could be afraid of this damn snake it's obviously a toy and yet she was having these these real reactions to it uh, which again just goes to show you the whole relative nature of this and how much your imagination plays into whatever you fear now of course if we go back into her childhood and, and her upbringing Maybe she had like a bad encounter with a snake. I don't really know. I never asked her what the deal was, but maybe, you know, maybe she saw real snakes and maybe a snake bit her or whatever that made her so fearful of them. So let's sort of get to the really fundamental core of what fear is about. Let's go even deeper than we went in part one. Existentially, what is it that you ultimately fear? I don't just mean a particular fear you have, but I mean fear in general. When you're fearing anything, what does it all ultimately boil down to? Ultimately, it all boils down to fear of yourself. Oddly enough. And that's very counterintuitive. You might wonder, well, why would I fear myself? And after all, Leo, if I'm... If I'm fearing something like a snake or if I'm fearing somebody killing my child or whatever, how is that fear of myself? This doesn't make sense. Except it does once you have a proper understanding of what a self is and what you as the self ultimately are. See, the problem is right now you have a very limited identity, a very limited notion of what a self is. So if you take yourself to be this physical human creature sitting here, uh, then yeah, in this sense, it doesn't make sense how you could fear yourself. But what I'm talking about is the self with a capital S. I'm talking about the ultimate awakened, enlightened self, your true self. What is that? That is the entire universe. You are consciousness manifesting itself as the entire universe, not just this physical body. Everything, including inanimate objects, and other people, animals, planets, stars, everything, and way beyond that, way more beyond that. And of course, if you take this very expanded, infinite sense of self, your largest identity, then that thing, that thing includes everything that you hate and that you fear. All the stuff you don't like about reality, all the evil stuff. It includes the murder and the rape and the theft and the genocide and the terrorism and the war and the environmental destruction and the the, the violence and the carelessness and the, the way that people treat each other in such bad ways, the manipulation, the scheming, uh, the various power hierarchies. 
giant corporations, religions, cults, closed mindedness, all of that evil shit that you don't like about the world that you're afraid of and that you want to keep at an arm's length away from you. That all of that is yourself. Now, of course, that's still not all of yourself. That's just a little part of yourself. You're much, much bigger than all of that. But that's what you're ultimately terrified of. See, consciousness is terrified of itself because what consciousness is, is it's infinite. It's everything. It's unlimited, which means it's the good and it's the bad. It's the beautiful and it's the ugly. It's all dualities. It's everything you can imagine and much, much more. And since in the end, the highest truth is oneness or non-duality, that means that nothing exists but you. The self is the only thing that exists. You do this work long enough, you become conscious enough, you realize that, that there's nothing in this universe but you because you're the entire universe. And so due to this, all fear ultimately boils down to self-fear. What you fear is your own scope. Your own infinite scope terrifies you. And that's the whole challenge of life, existentially speaking, is that you're born and you start to identify as this little creature, this weak, fragile little human creature, this baby, this child, and then you're growing up and then you're still identifying with that. And then even as an adult, you're still identifying with that. And you're stuck with this very limited identification and you're terrified of all the stuff around you. You might be scared of the dark. You might be scared of snakes. You might be scared of airplanes. But as you grow more and more and more through life, you, you know, your childhood fears, you outgrow them. You're no longer scared of the dark the way you used to be. Maybe you outgrow your phobia of snakes. Maybe you get over your fear of airplanes. Maybe you get over your fear of being poor. You get over your fear of the opposite sex. You get over your fear of marriage. You get over your fear of children, having children and all of this. And this, you're growing. You're experiencing more of life and you're, you're coming to accept more and more of it until you reach a point where you realize it's not just that you're becoming less fearful. It's that what's actually happening that entire time is that your entity is expanding and expanding and expanding and you're accepting more and more and more of reality as it actually is rather than denying it or resisting it or rejecting it or judging it or hating it. You're embracing more and more of it until finally you realize that what you really are is you are infinity itself, the infinite universe itself. You are all of the stuff that you hated and were afraid of. And at this point, what happens is that the distinction between self and other disappears. And you merge back into the entire universe. The limited becomes unlimited. But that process of the limited moving towards the unlimited and finally breaking through and accepting it and merging into it, that entire process, that is what we call life. That's what's happening to all people. And then the only question is, is, is how smoothly does that process work for you? Or are you resisting it and are you being like a stubborn mule as life is pushing you towards realizing your full infinite self, but you're resisting it? and holding on to various ideologies or you're denying it in some way because you're scared. See, it's very scary to recognize what you are. And so ultimately what's happening here in life is that God is becoming aware of itself. You are becoming more and more aware that you are God and that you created this entire universe. And you are being forced by the truth to accept your true nature, which is the infinite universe, which includes all that ugly stuff that was threatening to you when you were younger. And so you need to be very strong and courageous in order to be able to accept what you really are, whereas most people are in denial about what they really are. They don't want to accept that they're God. It's too much of a responsibility it's too threatening. It's too scary to their limited little identity. And so for most people, what they do, what they have is they have a, a very fixed sense of other. There's like myself 
and then there's the other out there. And you know, myself doesn't just include my body, but it includes my family, my tribe, my nation, my religious identity, my culture, and all that. And then everything that's not that is other. And then that's what's being defended. And so fear arises precisely because that sense of other has been created. But see, to realize that you are God means that you have to shed this notion or sense of other. And that's what life is all about. How you define self versus other. And this, we're told that this is a physical thing, that there's a physical boundary between myself and then the other. But of course, this is purely an imaginary boundary. And that's the thing that freaks you out to discover. This is why when people take psychedelics and that boundary between self and other is dissolved, it scares them. It scares the shit out of them. They think they're going crazy. They think they're losing their mind. They think they're having some sort of uh, psychotic break. <laughs> you're not having a psychotic break. Actually, your psychosis is thinking that there is a difference between you and other. That's the psychosis. The truth is that there is no such difference. But that's very scary. So as it turns out, fear of self is identical to fear of other, is identical to fear of reality, is identical to fear of God, is identical to fear of consciousness, is identical to fear of truth, and it's identical to fear of love. Because all those things ultimately are identical. And that's what you really fear. You fear the enormity of what you are. Because what you are is so epic and so enormous that it's difficult for consciousness to accept itself. Going from the very limited form to the totally unlimited form. So ultimately, how do you transcend fear? By expanding your sense of self. And that's what this work ultimately boils down to. That's all we're doing throughout all these videos, is we're trying to expand your sense of self. And as you do that, you should fear less and less. Until finally you reach a point where the difference between self and other completely collapses. And when this happens, all, feel, all fear will disappear. But that's a very radical state of consciousness to get to. Most people will never experience this in their life. So, of course, in practice, they have a lot of fear. God is the total absence of fear. It's total self-acceptance. It's the total absence of other. In other words, God is identical to oneness, to infinite love, to truth, to selflessness, to freedom, to consciousness, to immortality, and to liberation, and to peace. That's what God is. It's consciousness which has totally accepted itself. While you're in human form, while you're in the ego mind, you are consciousness which has not fully accepted itself. It's consciousness which isn't conscious of what consciousness is, whereas God is consciousness which is infinitely conscious of what consciousness is. That's the only difference. So right now you are God, but you don't know that you're God. You're not conscious that you're God. You're not conscious that you're designing your entire body and that you're dreaming up this entire scene that you're sitting in. This entire room is something you're dreaming up right now. It's something you're hallucinating, but you don't experience it as such. You're not conscious enough to experience that. Nor are you conscious enough to realize that you are me talking to you. There's no Leo here. You invented me. Your mind is inventing me right now, and it's inventing all these words. And so really, you're just talking to yourself. And it's this that you're afraid of realizing at a very, very deep level. And you can realize it at ever deeper levels. The deeper you go, the more fear you will shed. And then until ultimately, you will reach a state where you will be totally fearless because you will have completely transcended any kind of limited identity. So if you're wondering, is it possible to be totally fearless? The answer is yes, but not in your current state of consciousness. It requires a radically expanded non-dual state of consciousness. It requires a deep awakening, more than one, multiple deep awakenings. And then even then, even after that, it requires a lot of follow-up work. Because when we're talking about being totally fearless, we're not just talking about having an awakening. We're also talking about rewiring your entire mind, all the habits from birth 
you know, decades of habits. This is, this is very challenging to do. Even after an awakening, most people will still experience fear because your mind has not been rewired. Now begins the process of emotional mastery, which, which is even harder than awakening. So in practice, realistically, the only people who will ever transcend fear entirely are hardcore mystics like Jesus or Buddha. And even in their case, I don't know how much they totally transcended fear. It's hard to know. Personally, I've been in states of consciousness that had no fear in them whatsoever. There was no fear of death. There was no fear of pain. There was no fear of suffering. All the worst stuff that you think would be natural for, for a human to fear, it was completely gone. But that's not a state of consciousness that's easily sustained. Uh, the thing here, though, is to not get stuck on being a perfectionist. You might hear me saying this. You might say, oh, well, Leo, then then it, what, you, you make it sound like I'm never going to achieve this. This is something super rare. Well, first of all, it is super rare. How often do you find a totally fearless person? Almost never. So, of course, it has to be super rare. Uh, and as far as you not achieving it, you probably never will. But that's not important because what's more important is not to reach some sort of Jesus Christ level of consciousness, but simply to improve your situation. And your situation can be improved a lot when it comes to fear. Right? So even though you might never reach a point in your life where you're totally fearless, it's okay. You can still improve a lot, and that will reduce a lot of suffering in your life, make your life a lot better, make your survival a lot easier, a lot smoother. So that's what we're really talking about here. I don't want you to get caught on this trap of perfectionism. The reason that it's unrealistic for the average person to transcend fear is simply because as long as you think that you have something important to lose in life, you will be afraid. Basically, if you want to be fearless, what you have to do is you have to completely surrender your whole life. Everything. You have to surrender every single desire, every single attachment that you have. You have to stop caring about, the, about whether you live or die. You have to stop caring about whether your, your children live or die. Um, you have to completely detach from everything. And the average person simply isn't willing to do that. Nor are they willing to put in the decades of practice that are necessary to actually rewire themselves to reach that point. It's an extremely radical decision to make in your life and then to actually do it. It takes a very special kind of character. Uh, the average person is not going to do this. Even the average person who watches me and listens to me is not going to ever do this. It's too much to ask for. But nevertheless, it's good to put this out there so that you understand that it is a possibility. So, you know, don't let me limit you. If you're really serious about becoming a Buddha or a Christ, you can do it. But you're going to have to devote your whole life to it and realize the cost. It's not something that you're going to be able to do while maintaining your old life as it was. This is going to be a complete transformation of your whole life. You're choosing to, to willfully surrender your whole life. Are you interested in that? See? Probably not. I'm just laying it out in realistic terms for you so that you're not kidding yourself. Because a lot of people, they get into this awakening work and then they think, oh, well, I'm going to become this, this Jesus or this Buddha figure. I'm going to be fearless and I'm going to be invincible and immortal. Well, <laughs> are you willing to sacrifice for that? Are you willing to make the ultimate sacrifice, which is stop caring about whether you're alive or not? That's what it's going to take. So, you know, it's very radical. <laughs> Understand that it's radical. Also, this explains why it's so rare. Why most people think it's impossible. It's not impossible. It just seems impossible because it's so radical that so few people do it that for the average person, it might as well be impossible because they're so attached to life as they've lived it, to the way that they were raised, to their friends, to their family, to their religion, to their culture, to their science, to their beliefs, to their ideas. They're so attached to this stuff that it's, it's, a, it's a joke to even talk about 
fearlessness with these people. These people will always be afraid because they always have something that they're clinging to that they're afraid of losing. You might wonder, well, Leo, what about you? Do you ever experience fear or are you totally fearless now? And of course, the answer is yes, I experience fear. I experience plenty of fear. But then you might wonder, well, Leo, then doesn't that make you a hypocrite? And how do you really know that it's even possible to transcend fear if you haven't even done it yourself? Well, first of all, recognize that I'm still in the early stages of this work. I'm working on myself all the time. I'm doing various practices. And so I have a lot more room for growth. I have not maxed out by any means. Uh, but secondly, I've been in states of consciousness where I have transcended all fear. And I have seen through fear as an illusion. All fear is ultimately untrue in the absolute sense. So that's how I know that it's possible. But I don't live from that level of consciousness 24-7. I'd have a lot more work to do to achieve that. So I'm nowhere near that. But of course, uh, again, it's not about being perfect. It's not so much about living from that state of conscious 24-7. It's just about improving your situation. I'm a lot less fearful of life than I was 10 years ago or five years ago. And that's really the most important thing. And this is where this stuff gets practical, right? For most people, becoming a Buddha or a Jesus, not practical. But becoming a lot less fearful in your business, in your relationship, in your career, and so forth, that's very practical. And we're going to talk about that in this episode coming up here. Recognize that there are many degrees of fear, right? You know, some people are so afraid, they're afraid to leave their house. Some people are so afraid, they're afraid to look another human in the eyes. Some people are so afraid that they don't even, like, approach a stranger and ask them for help. Or they don't even talk with their neighbors because they're afraid of social situations or they're afraid of approaching some woman that they, they, they see at the grocery store that they are attracted to, but they're too afraid to approach her and to start a conversation. You know, this, this sort of basic stuff, this, this we can really work on. Or like you're afraid to go off and start your business or start working on that life purpose of yours. This is stuff that we can work on, and this is very practical, and this will improve your life a lot. You should also distinguish here between overcoming specific fears versus transcending fear as a whole. These are really different pursuits because you have many unique specific fears. Hopefully you did that homework assignment from part one and you've identified and you're more familiar with the various fears that you have and you can tackle fears individually. Like maybe you have a fear of snakes or a fear of airplanes or a fear of going broke. You can work on each of those individually, but no matter how many of those you squash, you will still not transcend fear as a general dynamic in your life. Because to transcend that requires doing very deep existential work, having various awakenings. But nevertheless, it can still be useful to work on specific fears that are holding you back in life. Like maybe you have some fear within your marriage or within your relationship that's ruining your relationship. And by fixing that, you can make your marriage or your relationship work much better. That's great, but recognize that um, you're sort of in a sinking ship and you're plugging one hole at a time and new holes are being created every minute. So that you're playing a game that you're never really going to win so long as you're doing that. You're still basically stuck in the loop of survival by squashing one fear at a time. Um, most people will go through life and they will resolve certain specific fears they've had. And you're probably like this. There are probably fears that you had 10 years ago that you don't have anymore. And now you think about them, you look back at the situation, you laugh, and you're like, oh, it's, it's funny, it's, it's crazy that I used to fear this thing, which now I no longer fear. You can probably think of some of those. But notice that your life is still dominated by fear. You have hundreds of micro fears every day, and then you have still many macro fears, and this will keep happening. And in fact, what I'm saying is that no matter how many fears you squash, there will still be more fears for you to squash. Because the problem is that you're not tackling the root of the problem. 
You see, you're dealing with specific fears, finite fears. But the problem is that reality is infinite. So there's going to be an infinite number of stuff for you to fear. So by coping or resolving each one individually, you know, like maybe you fear airplanes, so you fix that. Okay, now you fear snakes, so you fix that. But then you fear aliens and, you know, humans encounter aliens, let's say, in the next thousand years. And so you fear aliens. Let's say you fix that. Well, then there's another species of aliens. How many species of aliens are there that could threaten humanity? Probably millions of them, given how many stars and galaxies there are in the universe. And then maybe there are universes beyond that. So, I mean, like, you're always going to have something you're afraid of. You see? So this is a never-ending game unless you go to the root and you completely surrender your life. And then, then there's a chance that you can, you can kind of grasp infinity as a whole and surrender to infinity as a whole and then at that point, uh, well, there's the possibility of eliminating all of these fears in one fell swoop. But of course, it's not really going to be in one fell swoop. You're going to do decades of work to get there. And you're going to surrender your whole life. Is fear a thought, you might wonder? Obviously, thought contributes to fear, but are they the same thing? And the answer is no. I want you to notice through mindfulness work, that fear is a feeling. You feel it in your body. It's a distinctive feeling. It's distinct from anger. It's distinct from happiness. It's distinct from sexual arousal. It's distinct from frustration. It's fear. That's what that word refers to, a feeling in your body. So the best way that you can get a sense for what fear is, is to feel it in your body. Now, of course, Thoughts contribute to that feeling. When that feeling arises is determined by what you're thinking and how much you're thinking it and what kind of mental imagery you're conjuring up in your mind. But ultimately, those thoughts create that feeling. Now, of course, that feeling can also then create thoughts of its own, which kind of creates a, a, a vicious circle. But fear is a feeling. So recognize that and try to distinguish it from other feelings. This takes mindfulness practice. And this is important to practice this because a lot of people will confuse anger with fear as though they're the same thing, as though they're the one type of feeling. They're not, but it, you got to go inside and feel yourself in those different situations to distinguish those two. Another common question that comes up here with regards to fear is as follows. Is there truth behind fear, or is all fear inaccurate perception? What about situations where my fear is justified? What if a situation is actually legitimately dangerous? Then isn't it legitimate that I fear it? Here's where it's important to distinguish between absolute truth and relative truths. So in the absolute sense, all fear is false, and it's inaccurate perception. But in the relative sense, fear can be a, a valuable indicator of something that's going to be harmful or dangerous to whatever you identify with being. So in that sense, yes, you can be justified to fear certain things, and then certain other fears could be unjustified, we might say. For example, if you're an American, is it a justified fear to fear that America is going to be invaded by some foreign country like Iran or Iraq or North Korea? No, because America has by far the largest military force of like the top 10 other countries combined. More than Russia, China, uh, Brazil and India and Pakistan all combined. <laughs> the U.S. has more firepower. So the chances of, of America getting invaded are very small. So this fear would be a rather irrational fear. But now, if you lived in North Korea, is, there a, is it a justified fear to fear that North Korea would be invaded by a foreign country? Yes, <laughs> of course. Because North Korea is completely overpowered by China, by South Korea and the U.S. Uh, relationship. There's various kinds of powerful alliances that are aligned against North Korea. So there's a, there's a reasonable chance that North Korea might get bombed in the next 50 years by some American-backed coalition. 
So from North Korea's point of view, that's a legitimate fear. They have to be concerned about that. See? So it is important to, to make these kinds of relativistic distinctions. But in the ultimate sense, if we're talking about existentially speaking, spiritually speaking, um, even when a fear is justified, so to, so to speak, um, it's still ultimately untruthful because it's relative to your survival. Yes, if you live in North Korea and you're, let's say, a dictator in North Korea, yes, if you want to, if you want to maintain your dictatorship, if you want to maintain your life relative to that identity that you have, that you cling to, yes, then you should be very afraid of Americans and South Koreans and maybe the Chinese and so forth. But, but if you give that up, then you shouldn't be afraid. See, now the problem though is of course, nobody is willing to give up their life. Nobody is willing to give up their comfy little position. No, no dictator is willing to leave his dictatorship of his own free will. And oftentimes he can't because he'll be killed. So uh, in this situation, to even entertain the idea of giving all this up is, is a, is a non-starter for most people, unless they're interested in spiritual work, in which case then it becomes a, a serious possibility. And it's not just a joke. Another question that comes up is, isn't it dangerous to eliminate fear? If we eliminate all fear, what will keep us alive? Well, here's where it's really radical. Here's where you got to bite the bullet. Understand that when we're talking about eliminating all fear, if you successfully eliminate all fear, what this means is that you no longer care whether you're alive. Literally, you no longer care. If you still care, you haven't eliminated all fear. So as long as you're attached to life, you will fear. So even to ask this question like, well, Leo, but what's going to keep me alive if I get rid of fear? The answer is nothing. And you have to accept that answer and you have to say, okay, well, fine then. I'm fine with that. If you're still saying, no, that's terrible. Well, Leo, then I'm not going to eliminate all fear because I want to stay alive. If you think that way, then you're going to be afraid for the rest of your life. You haven't understood how deep this goes. You're too afraid of surrendering your life. You see? <laughs> so, of course... You're not going to accept the, the radical things that I'm saying here. But there's there's a, a second little uh, element here, and even a third one, which will uh, kind of take the edge off. So I'm not saying you have to literally physically die in order to eliminate this fear. I'm saying you have to be willing to. Now, to be willing to, to surrender to the idea that you will die, is different than actually dying. You see? So you can surrender to the idea of it without necessarily having to shoot yourself in the head, for example. And so this other element here is the thing that's going to keep you from danger if you get rid of fear is consciousness and wisdom. These turn out to actually be more effective at safeguarding you than fear. And this is what people overlook. A lot of people think that, well, if I get rid of my fear, then nothing's going to protect me. Well, that's because you've been living your whole life using this very crude way of surviving, a very crude motivation called fear. And it has worked to some extent, but it can only get you so far. If you want to go beyond that, if you really want to get good at survival, actually what you need is not fear, but consciousness and wisdom. Because it's more effective in the long run. And so if you're wondering, like, well, if some enlightened master like Jesus or Buddha, if, if he's eliminated all fear, then how does he stay alive to a ripe old age? Well, not Jesus, of course, but let's say Buddha. Buddha lived supposedly into his 70s or 80s. How did he do that? Well, because of consciousness and wisdom. You don't need to be terrified of a thing in order to avoid it. You can just recognize that, well, that's like a dangerous object, and I should steer clear of that thing. 
I shouldn't stick my hand in a fire, not because I'm terrified to, not because it's going to produce a bunch of pain, but simply because I recognize that if I stick my hand in that fire, then I'm going to have a problem on my hands. <laughs> I'm going to have to go to the hospital. I'm going to have to pay money to get my hand fixed. I'm not going to, maybe, maybe I lose my hand that I won't be as effective at doing the stuff that I need to do. So it doesn't fit with my plans for the future of my life. And through this consciousness and wisdom, you can avoid sticking your hand in the fire. You see? It's more like a, a positive motivation than a negative motivation. And it's much better to live your life from a positive motivation. Another thing that will keep you from harm is caution. Healthy caution. And here we need to now make the distinction between fear and caution. Fear, remember I said, is a feeling in your body. It's the feeling of being afraid. Caution is just the recognition, the consciousness, that something might be dangerous or harmful to you. So it's the following difference. I can be terrified of bears, for example, versus I can be cautious of bears when I'm walking through the forest. You see the difference there? If I was walking through the forest and I was fearful of bears, that means I would actually have the feeling in my body I would be tensing up, I would be anxious, I would be having images of bears chasing me and biting me and killing me. This would be legitimate fear. Whereas if I was cautious, let's say, for example, I went hiking or camping for a week out in the wilderness in the bush in Alaska, where there are lots of bears. And I brought a gun with me because I was conscious and wise, you know, I, I read the books, I read the, I read the newspapers, I know that there's plenty of bears in Alaska, so of course, I bring a gun with me just in case, to spook them off, let's say if I see one in the woods, he's coming at me, at least I can fire the thing in the air, maybe not even at him, but just in the air, just to, to make some loud sound and spook him off. And then in, in the last case resort, I would shoot him in the face, if he came close enough. Okay, well, see, in this case, I bring the gun, not because I have a like a crippling fear in my chest, but because preemptively I kind of thought about the situation, I recognized the potential dangers that are involved here, and uh, I want to be able to survive this camping encounter. <laughs> I want to come back home after a week, right? I don't want to die there, so I make a conscious decision that, yeah, I'll bring some firepower with me. That's the difference between fear and caution. See, I can be cautious without feeling fear. Caution is about anticipating likely obstacles and threats. Uh, another example for you is using a condom. You can put on a condom as a guy out of caution. It, you don't need to be feeling fear in your heart or in your belly right before sex. And then that's the thing that gets you to put on the condom. You don't need that. In fact, most people, I think, when they put on a condom, they're not deathly afraid. They put on the condom as just a precaution because they know how this process works. They know the danger of pregnancy and all this, and so they just put it on. Contrast that now with somebody who didn't use a condom, and then the, the morning after, you know, they're terrified. Oh, oh, you know, what happens if I got her pregnant? And then now you're actually afraid. Now you actually experience the fear in your chest and your belly. You're actually worried. You're having images of this pregnancy that you maybe don't want and all these problems that comes with that, all the hassles of it. See, that's the difference between caution and fear. For example, when I started Actualize.org, I sat down and I identified what are the various problems that I could encounter with my business that could derail my business. And one of the things I came up with was that, you know, what if my computers were broken, my hard drives crashed, and I lost all my data? Because, you know, my business is very data-driven. All my videos are, are stored, all my notes, and all this stuff. So a lot of important stuff is stored on hard drives. So I identified that as a potential obstacle and threat. And then I, you know, I wasn't afraid of this in some crippling sense. I wasn't having nightmares over this. 
um, I wasn't like feeling it deep in my belly. I just identified it rationally as a as a serious potential obstacle because you know computers crash, hard drives crash, sometimes they're stolen, sometimes there's a fire or something. So what I did is I just I installed a, a special backup system, so like a backup unit, which sucks the data from my main hard drives into the backup hard drives. So I installed that. You know, I paid a couple thousand dollars for it. I need a lot of hard drive space to back stuff up. It's not in the cloud. It's my own system. I had to engineer that thing. I had to figure out how it all works. I had to set it all up so that it works. I had to test it and make sure that it's reliable. So yeah, that, that took some investment. And that took some time and energy and all that. And now I have that system. So see, this is a good example of caution versus fear. Uh, you know, speaking of uh, of fear and, and bears in the woods, actually, uh, one time I wanted to go tripping on LSD in the woods with my girlfriend at the time, ex-girlfriend now. And so we went on this road trip to a, a big national park. And this was a giant national park. There was lots of forests, lots of mountains, high up in the mountains. And so we drove around this thing and we found a good spot where we could trip. We wanted to do like a nice trip throughout the, the afternoon. And so we found this nice little spot high up in the mountains. It was very secluded. There was no people there. It was like a little pond, a little lake. Um, and there was a big forest and mountains there and all that. And so I was cautious though, because I knew that, you know, if I was tripping with her and I was in the middle of a deep trip, you know, th this place has bears in it. So, I planned it out and I, I thought about like, we're gonna do it like this. We're gonna sort of set up a little picnic area by the pond and we're gonna be rather close to the car in case we need to be. And she's gonna get a full dose of LSD, but I'm only gonna trip on like a, a quarter of a dose because I wanna have my wits about me just in case there are bears so that I can I can have like a, some, some sense and so that I, I could be capable in that situation, be able to manage that situation. And so that's what we did. And we tripped all day long. I only took a little a little minor dose. So I still had my wits about me. She took a big dose. She had a great trip. Um, and throughout that time, at moments, I was a little bit scared that maybe a bear will, will creep up on us or something like that. And, uh, and nothing like that happened. And it was great. And then at the very end of that day, it was started, the sun is starting to set and our trip was almost over. We were both coming down. It was great. It was beautiful. Um, then we just went and started to hike around. Uh, we went up to, on this little hill and we just kind of hiked up there and we were just talking and, and kind of walking and just uh, getting ready to go back home. And then we hear footsteps, heavy footsteps in the bushes right in front of us. And we both pause and we just kind of like look at each other like, did you just hear that? Or am I tripping? <laughs> and she looked at me and I looked at her and we were just like, we were transfixed. And then the footsteps, they keep getting closer and louder. And this is like some big footsteps. This is a big animal. We don't see any animal. We just see like <laughs> and rustling in the bushes. And it's coming closer to us. And I'll tell you, like at that point, I was, I was truly terrified. Like that was real fear. <laughs> That's real fear right there. Um, because I knew this was not good. She was also quite terrified. Um, and we were still both a little bit on the LSD, but this was definitely not some <laughs> mere hallucination. Uh, and then what I started to do, I grabbed, I had a hiking stick. I grabbed the hiking stick and I started to like hit a tree really loud and mm, started to yell and to scream just to make a lot of noise. And then we kind of like listened for the footsteps and they stopped for a while. And then about 30 seconds later, they continue and they're coming closer and closer to us. And we were just, so, we were so terrified at that point that we just, we just hauled all, ass off that, off that hill and we ran back and quickly grabbed all our picnic gear and all that stuff. And we just ran back to the car and we made it out of there. And we never saw the bear, but my guess is that it was probably a small, small black bear.
probably not a grizzly bear, but a small black bear. We never saw it, but it was definitely there. And if we stayed stuck around, it probably would have come at us. So, you know, that just sort of illustrates to you the difference between how fear and caution works. So you have to be careful here. So when we're talking about being fearless, don't get the idea that you should be reckless and that you shouldn't take seriously certain relative obstacles. When you're living life, when you're trying to survive, and that is what you're doing most of the time, there are relative obstacles to your life that you need to watch out for. Sometimes it comes in the form of a bear. Sometimes it comes in the form of, of a person that you need to be careful of because he's a dangerous person that you shouldn't be associated with. Or it might come in the form of a, of a business danger that comes down the road for your business. Yeah, you got to take some of these seriously as long as you care about your business, as long as you care about your relationships, as long as you care about uh, your life relative to that. So just realize that it's relative to that. It's not absolutely true. It's relatively a, a, an obstacle to that attachment that you have. And that's okay, because you're still going to have many of these attachments, most likely, for a long time to come. All right, let's move on to some more questions. But Leo, doesn't God want us to fear him? Otherwise, what would prevent us from sinning? Absolutely not. Any religion or spiritual teaching based on fear is a corruption, is a falsehood, is a delusion, is ego, is devilry. God does not want you <laughs> to fear him. God loves you no matter how much you sin. You might wonder, well, but Leo, why would God love me if I sin? Because God is conscious that it's you. See, unlike you, who thinks that you are separate from God and that God is something other than you, God knows that it's you. So how can God judge you if God is you? Anything sinful that you do is God doing it. And God is too conscious to judge or to hate itself. So he can't hate you. God accepts your sins as its own perfection. So it's really you who is judging you for your sins, not God. You're projecting your own judgment of your sins onto God. Because you think God would judge you. And the reason you think God would judge you is because you, you've painted God to be a devil, like you are. A devil judges. But God is not a devil, so God doesn't judge. Now you might wonder, but why do so many religions teach fear? If God is all love. Because most major religions are corrupt. They're about power. They're not about truth. They're not about love. Because of projection. Because the people who are running these major religions are themselves not conscious of what God is. So instead, what they're doing is they're just acting out from their ego, from their ideas of what God is. And their ideas is that God is just some bearded man in the clouds who looks down upon you and judges you. This is a very childish, simplistic, and false notion of God. It's a projection. So the people who teach the organized major religions are themselves devils and egos, and they project their own devilry and ego and fear onto God. They project their own judgment onto God. So if some Christian evangelical preacher is afraid of homosexuality and thinks that it's evil and bad, he judges it, he hates it, he then projects his own hatred and fear of homosexuality onto God, and then he teaches you that God hates homosexuals. Of course, nothing could be further from the truth because God is homosexuals. God loves homosexuals. But, you know, good luck convincing the preacher of this. And the reason the preacher can't understand this is simply because he's not conscious enough to know what God is. He's not speaking from direct experience of God. He's just speaking from the dogma and the ideology that he's picked up when he was a kid. And now he's just preaching that. So he knows not what he preaches. 
he doesn't actually understand the true teachings of Christ. Because if he did, he would never portray God as a judger or a hater or uh, someone who punishes you for your sins, because this is, this is completely the opposite of what God is. This is a bastardization of God. This is actually a demonization of God. And the reason the religions teach fear is because these religions have been watered down for egos, for simple folk. These major religions, they basically understood that serious enlightenment is unattainable for the masses. And so what we need to do is we just need to, we need to water down the teachings of enlightened masters to ordinary folks. But the teachings of enlightened masters are so radical. The truth and love is so radical. God is so radical that how do you teach it? How do you teach it to closed-minded people? How do you teach it to egotistical people? How do you teach God to devils? By turning God into a devil. That's the only way that devils will accept God, is if they start to treat God as a devil. And that's exactly what Muslims do, Christians do, Hindus do. They've turned God into a devil because they themselves are devils. They have to turn God into something bring it down to their to their own level you see that's the that's the twisted irony of how religion works now when it comes to science you might think well scientific method surely is above fear but the answer is no it's not science fears many things contrary to this kind of silly, naive notion of science as being this hyper-rational, objective activity. It's not. Science is highly subjective, and it's, it's permeated by fear. Fear of what? What do scientists fear? They fear mysticism. They fear magic. They fear the paranormal. They fear God. They fear falsehood. They fear losing credibility. They fear psychedelics. They fear idealism. They fear relativity. They fear subjectivity. They fear emotions. They fear irrationality. These are all common fears that scientifically minded people have. Now, of course, they will deny these fears. They will try to couch these fears in rationalism. As though it's like, well, Leo, but it's rational to not want these things. I don't fear God, it's just that God doesn't exist. Leo, I don't fear the paranormal, it's just the paranormal is bullshit. But actually, that's fear masquerading as rationality. See, here you have to be very careful about how your own mind tricks you into rationalizing your fears as something that's objective and factual and true, when actually it's, it's more emotional than factual. It's more subjective than objective. That's what scientists are largely in denial about. They're afraid to admit of the subjective underpinnings of science. A scientist, you have to remember, is committed to the survival of science. That's his identity. So you better believe that anything that threatens that identity, he's going to fear and be defensive about and going to be in denial about. And that's exactly what corrupts science. So... The same stuff that corrupts uh, religion, also the, those same dynamics corrupt science, just in a, in a different way, you see. In all of these cases, what's happening is that an, a limited identity is being constructed, whether a religious one or a scientific one, and then whatever you construct and you identify with, that's the thing that you're going to be defending and the thing that you're going to be scared to lose. Now let's get to the heart of this episode, which is, remember I promised you in part one that I would give you the top 10 tools for overcoming fear? So let's do that right now. In fact, I'm going to give you two extra ones that I've brainstormed since then. So it's going to be 12, 12 methods for dealing with fear. Method number one is to face the fear head on, to bite the bullet and to just do it. Do the thing you fear. It's very straightforward. It's not any kind of trick. It doesn't really make the process any easier. 
See, the problem is that when you ask me for techniques, really what you're asking me, you're not really asking for a technique only. You're asking for some way to make the process easier for you. So when I tell you that you just have to bite the bullet and face the fear head on, you don't like that idea. You want some way to escape the fear. Leo, give me a technique where I don't have to experience the fear, where I don't have to face it. Well, sorry, but the whole problem with fear is that if you're avoiding the fear because you're afraid, that just deepens your fear. It makes the situation worse. See? So like, if you're afraid of leaving your house because you have that kind of phobia and you don't feel safe outside, what do you got to do in that situation? Do you need to look for some sort of chemical pill that you take that makes it easy for you? Or do you have to read some sort of complicated book about what to do? No, you know what to do. What you have to do is you have to push yourself out of your house. Do the very thing that you've been avoiding, that you've been procrastinating. And just by doing that, that brings immediate relief. So, it's simple, but this is really the most effective method, in a certain sense. If you're afraid of the dark, what do you got to do? You got to go be in the dark. It's just that simple. Number two. Method number two, put yourself proactively to challenging situations. What can happen in life often is that we get very comfortable. We get into a certain groove. We find our niche and we get comfortable in that situation to the point where we get lazy. We get complacent. We just get comfortable in our job. We get comfortable in a relationship, in our family situation. Even if it's very dysfunctional, we still get comfortable in it. And we don't proactively push our comfort zone. So with this technique number two, you're being bold on purpose. You're sort of adopting this as, as a life strategy. The way that you're making choices in your life, you're making choices which are a little bit bold, which are a little bit scary, which are pushing you out of what you've been used to doing. So for example, you make the decision to quit your job and to start a new business. That's a bold decision that mo most people would not make because they would just rationalize to themselves, well, I can just stay in this job. After all, it does pay me a good paycheck. After all, it does have nice medical benefits. After all, I am sort of reasonably happy here. It's not so bad. It could be worse. You know, with that kind of logic, you're never going to leave your job. You're never going to start your new business. Whereas if you're adopting the strategy of being a little bit more bold and putting yourself into challenging situations, then you would recognize that, wait a minute, if I stay at this job, even if it's kind of comfortable, I'm going to fall into a rut. I'm going to get lazy and complacent. I should push myself just because I'm too comfortable here. I should just push myself to quit this job and to start something new, try something new. By starting this new business, I'm going to experience new challenges. That's going to require more of me as a human. It's going to require me to grow. It's going to require me to face various other fears that I have and to overcome those. And overall, that's going to make me develop more self-esteem. It's going to build confidence in myself. And this eventually will make me less fearful in life overall. That's a very good strategy. In fact, I did that 10 years ago when I became an entrepreneur and I started my first business. I did exactly that. I quit a reasonably good job that was paying good money, that I was comfortable in, that I could have stayed in for another decade. But I knew, I just knew I had this intuitive feeling that I need to push myself and to be bold. And I did that and that was one of the best decisions I ever made. And in that process, I overcame a lot of various fears that I would not have been able to overcome had I just stayed in my old job and I could have still been there 10 years later. Another example of this might be to commit to a relationship that you're afraid to commit to. A lot of guys have this problem where they don't want to commit to a, to a serious relationship. That's a fear. Be bold, push your comfort zone, commit to this relationship, Try to see how far you can take it. And if, if it blows up, if it, if, if it goes wrong, well, so, so what? Accept that, bite that bullet, and just go into it. See what happens. Conversely, maybe you have the other problem. Maybe, and this is often a problem that females have, is maybe you need to be bold by breaking a dysfunctional relationship. Maybe right now you're comfortable in some dysfunctional relationship, that's providing you with some of the benefits of being in a relationship, but ultimately you know that this can't last. It's not the right guy for you. 
but you're afraid to break it off. My suggestion here, if you're following this method number two, is push yourself, be bold. Have the courage to leave this guy. Have the courage to, to go it alone for a while. Have the courage to raise your standards. Have the courage to find a new guy. Another example of being bold might be if you're a guy and you're at the grocery store and you see some cute girl there at the produce department. You're attracted to her. Normally, what would you do? You wouldn't approach her. You're too scared. So in this method number two, you would push yourself and you would tell yourself, well, now that I'm scared, I have to do it. It's precisely because I'm uncomfortable that I have to do this. Let me push my comfort zone. Let me go over there and talk to her just to see what happens. Let's just see what happens. If she rejects me, well, oh well, she'll reject me. If she thinks I'm stupid and ugly, then that's what will happen. Let me just put myself out there and let me see what happens. And you'll do that. And that will grow you. And that will make you less scared overall, such that the next time it happens, it'll be a little bit easier. And if you do it again, the next time it happens, it'll be a little bit easier. And in this way, you can erode a lot of your fear of approaching women. Other examples might include asking your boss for a raise. Be bold. Push your salary. See how much you can get. Or pursuing your life purpose or your dream. Or moving to a new country. Be bold. Move to a new country. Like, for example, I have a, a friend who lived in Austin, Texas. And last year... He really sort of just got too comfortable and too fed up, and he just wanted something totally new. He had a very nice uh, software engineering job in Austin. He basically had a nice life there, but he pushed himself to move to Colombia. And he just quit his job, got up and left, and moved to a totally new country and lived in Colombia for six months. And last time I talked to him, he loved it there. See, that was a bold, bold move. How many of you would make a bold move like that? You see, and as he did that, of course, he overcame various kinds of fears. He grew himself. He challenged himself. And in this way, traveling around the world, living in different places, this is a very good way to grow yourself. And you can come up with many, many other examples of how to be bold in your life. So just be more bold. But of course, there's a fine line between being bold and being reckless. So be bold, but not in a stupid way where you're going off and doing dangerous things that could get you into trouble or that you might regret. So make sure you make that distinction. Okay, method number three for overcoming fear is training. Lots of training. This is really the point of training. This is how people get really good at whatever. Music, singing, speaking, lawyering, doctoring, competing, boxing, playing tennis, playing golf. How do they get good at it? Through training. And what is training? Training is nothing other than massive experience over and over again at a thing. Massive exposure to a thing. So, if you're afraid of something, consider the possibility that the only reason you're afraid of it is simply because you haven't been exposed to it enough. For example, if you're afraid of sex, it's probably because you haven't had a lot of sex. You have very little experience or training in sex. If you're afraid of talking to strangers, it's probably because you've talked to very little strangers in your life. We could probably count on one hand how many strangers you've started conversations with by yourself in your life. If that's the case for you, of course you're going to be afraid of talking with strangers. So what's the solution there? It's not some elaborate metaphysical enlightenment technique. It's just simply expose yourself. Go talk to a hundred strangers. I can almost guarantee you that by the time you initiate a hundred conversations with strangers, you will no longer be afraid of strangers. If you're afraid of, of approaching and, and chatting up beautiful women, what's the solution there? Is it to meditate more? No, the solution there is to go talk, chat up with a thousand beautiful women. Expose yourself to beautiful women. Have interactions with them. And then by your thousandth one, 
you're going to be so exposed to it that it's going to be impossible to be afraid at that point. Or your fear will just be very minimized. If you're, fear, if you're afraid of flying on airplanes, what's the solution there? Go fly on 100 airplanes. No, of course, <laughs> that costs a lot of money. But, you know, over your life, you fly a lot. The more you fly, the more comfortable you become with airplanes. If you're afraid of public speaking, what's the solution to that? Go join Toastmasters. Give 20 speeches as Toastmasters. By the time you give 20 speeches, you're going to be quite comfortable in front of a small crowd. Just simply through training and exposure. But also, I want to point out a little nuance here is that oftentimes exposure alone is not enough. The real key to overcoming fear is exposure plus mindfulness. So you're not just exposing yourself to something, you're exposing yourself to something mindfully, consciously. See? So the difference here is like, let's say, let's use the example of public speaking. I think, in fact, fear of public speaking through surveys, it's been found that it's one of the most common fears that people have. So this is a great example. So how would you actually practically tackle this fear in your life? You would join Toastmasters. It's an organization that you can go to. They're located all around the world. They have different chapters. It costs very little money. You, you join that little group. You go there and every week, once a week, you meet, almost like Alcoholics Anonymous, and you give a speech. People take turns giving speeches. Small speeches, five minutes, ten minutes long. And... As you give your speech, there's like five or ten people sitting there listening to you, giving you feedback. It's a very supportive kind of atmosphere. They're not judgmental. They don't criticize you. They, they, they give you pointers. So as you do that, though, you are going to be afraid. The first time you step up, step up, even in front of ten people in a small room where everybody is supporting you, you're still going to be afraid. You're going to be afraid of misspeaking. You're going to be afraid of forgetting your speech and uh, looking stupid and so forth. So as you stand up there and you're about to give your speech, the extra little twist that I would add to that is do that, but feel that fear. Feel into the fear as you're about to speak. In the middle of your speech, feel into the fear. Feel it in your body. Where is it located? Get, get comfortable with that fear feeling and continue with your speech. And if you do that 10, 20 times, you will probably make a significant dent in your fear of public speaking. Technique number four is rigorous mindfulness practice. This is something that I explain in my episode called Mindfulness Meditation. Go search for it. So with this method, and this is one of the most powerful methods for addressing fear overall, not just one specific fear, but just fear in general at the existential level. What you do is that you closely observe fear inside your body as it's happening. And you practice feeling very deeply into the fear. And not just fear, but just all sensations and all bodily feelings whatsoever. So it's not necessary that you're feeling fear right now in order to practice mindfulness. You can just start to practice mindfulness every single day using your ordinary body sensations. So right, right now, we could practice it. Feel the soles of your feet right now. You feel that? Put your attention on that for a moment. Just feel what that's like. And now shift your attention to the feeling of your palms. Don't move your palms. Just keep them where they are and, and feel how your palms feel. And now shift that attention to your face and feel how the front of your face feels. And now shift your attention to your ears and feel how the ears on your head feel. See, that's it. That's really all that this practice is, but you're doing it consistently. You're setting up a, a chunk of time, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 60 minutes a day to do this rigorous practice. And uh, this will help you enormously with overcoming fear overall in the long term in your life. As you practice this, then you'll be able to feel fear more when you're actually in a fearful situation and you're going to be mindful in that situation rather than just reactive. And specifically what I want you to notice 
is that when the feeling of fear comes up for you, that feeling itself of fear is an icky sort of feeling which is going to be resisted. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to be mindful enough to notice when that feeling of resistance to the ickiness of the fear is coming up and to feel into that resistance and to let go resisting such that you allow yourself to actually experience the fear. See, the problem is that most people, when we get afraid, it's not that just we just get afraid. We get afraid, but then that that fear feeling is kind of so icky that we want to escape from it as quickly as possible. And with this mindfulness practice, what you're going to do is actually you're going to linger in that fear. You're going to let that icky sensation, you're going to allow it to permeate your body, and you're not going to resist it, and you're not going to try to manipulate your way out of it or to escape it. You're just going to marinate in it. And through this process, you're going to gradually expose yourself to that icky feeling of fear. You're going to become more comfortable with it. And then over time, what this will do is make you less reactive to it. And ultimately, if you do this practice enough, seriously enough, you can completely um, nullify that fear and become so comfortable with it that it no longer affects you in the way that it affects normal people. The fifth technique is to be totally present. Just totally present. So when fear comes up for you next time, if you're able to be totally present, which of course probably requires that you have some meditation skills and abilities that you've been practicing, then what you can do is you can notice that your mind, in order to be fearful, what it's doing is it's jumping into the future and it's projecting images of bad stuff that's going to be happening in the future. And what you can, if you can, if you can manage to stop that by bringing your mind and grounding it in the present moment of just sitting here right now and not thinking about tomorrow, not thinking about what's going to happen with your child, not thinking about what's going to happen with your relationship, not thinking about what's going to happen with your business, but just cutting that chain of thought off and bring yourself right into the present moment and realizing that there's nothing to fear about the present moment. That's a powerful technique. The problem, though, is that in practice, most of you won't be able to do this unless you've had a couple of years of meditation practice. Because your mind will just be too active and it will jump into the future way too much. And you won't be able to be in the present. So this is one of the reasons why we meditate, is to be able to put ourselves in the present when we're then in a fearful situation or an angry situation or whatever. Just by grounding yourself in the present moment, this can eliminate negative emotions. But it takes some practice to get there. Now you might wonder, like, well, Leo, but what if the present moment contains some dangerous thing? What if there's a bear in the room right now? And you're telling me to be present, but if I'm present, the bear will get me. Shouldn't I be like running away? Well, first of all, recognize that most of the time, probably 99% of the time, this isn't the case. 99% of the time, when you fear something, you're not actually fearing something present. What you're doing is you're, you're fearing the future. In fact, technically speaking, this is true 100% of the time, which means that even if there is a bear in the room right now, if you're afraid of this bear, the reason you're afraid of this bear is not because there is a bear in the room presently. You're afraid of this bear because your mind is creating images of what this bear did, will do to you in five seconds. And that is an important distinction. Those five seconds of future is not the present. So technically, if there's a bear in the room and you're afraid of that bear, it's because you're living in the future. Now, of course, this is, this is sort of a more dangerous situation. We have to recognize that there is a physical danger if there's a bear in the room. But again, this is where we have to go kind of very existential and metaphysical and absolute. And we have to say that ultimately, remember, if you want to transcend all fear, you have to be able to transcend fear 
even in an actually dangerous situation. It can't be like, well, yeah, sure, Leo, I can meditate and be fearless when there's no danger. But then as soon as there's a real danger, then I can no longer apply those techniques. No, uh, actually what you have to do is you have to apply those techniques even more and you have to surrender the desire for life. So in this situation, to be totally fearless in this situation with this bear in this room, you have to actually uh, accept that this bear might kill you. Now, of course, that's hard to do. <laughs> of course, you don't want to do that. That's the last thing you want to do because you're so preoccupied with your survival. I understand that. But then again, this is an episode about how to conquer fear. So what do you want? Do you want me to tell you how to conquer fear or not? See, we can put you in more and more challenging situations. And that will be a test of how developed you are and how conscious you are. Most people, even if they do meditate, if we put them into a room with a bear, they're going to be afraid. That's just the reality of it. Because that's how serious survival is. And that's how difficult this emotional mastery is. Basically, I'm trying to convince you that it's very difficult to totally eliminate your fear. I'm trying to show you that fear is a very relentless and pervasive force in your life. And that it dominates your behavior. And it dominates your mind. And of course, that's true. And this bear example shows it very poignantly. But the mistake that people make is they think that, well, if the bear is in the room, then there's no way that I could possibly transcend that fear. And what I'm telling you is that, yes, there is a way, but it requires you to make a very radical mm, admission to yourself, which is that your desire for life itself is really mm, rather subjective and partial and untruthful and something that you could let go of with sufficient practice and consciousness. Okay, technique number six for dealing with fear is psychedelics. In fact, I would say that psychedelics are one of the most practical and powerful tools for dealing with fear. Because psychedelics put you face to face with death. And psychedelics erase all of your dualities and all of your boundaries between self and other. So they sort of force you into confronting existential fear in a way that I don't know any other technique that would do this so poignantly. So this has been demonstrated. It's not just my opinion. This has been demonstrated by clinical and scientific studies on psychedelics. Psychedelics are now recognized by more and more scientific studies to help with PTSD, to help with end of life fears for people who are experiencing terminal illnesses like terminal cancer. It's helping them to cope with that. Why is that? Precisely because with PTSD, it's a fear problem. And with, uh, with terminal cancer, it's a fear problem. It's a fear of death in the case of terminal cancer. And psychedelics are very effective for this. And personally, in my own life, I'll tell you this. Um, I don't think any, any one technique has helped me the most in facing my own fears more than psychedelics. I don't think psychedelics can be your only tool here. So don't think that you can ignore all the other techniques and just do psychedelics. But psychedelics are a very, very powerful tool. Especially because they'll, they'll get you at the existential aspect of fear that otherwise most people are just not conscious enough. You really need that change in consciousness which the psychedelic offers to be able to start to understand some of the more radical, existential, metaphysical aspects of this fear conversation that we've been having over these two episodes. Some of the stuff that I've said here, like this distinction between self and other and how that contributes to fear, or some of the stuff that I've said about being able to transcend all fear, or some of the stuff that I've said about how fear relates to love, these are existential aspects that you will really only be able to fully appreciate on some psychedelics.
Technique number seven is Kriya Yoga. I highly recommend this form of yoga. What it does, is it rewires your whole mind and your whole nervous system. Obviously, I can't go into how to practice that yoga here. It's quite technical and involved. We have a mega thread on my forum in the spirituality sub forum where there's a mega thread where we discuss Kriya Yoga and various ways that you can learn it, various books. I also have books available on my book list. I have three or four books that explain Kriya Yoga beautifully and how to do it, so you can start to do your own practice. I also have an episode called The Importance of Yoga. Search for that one, and there I talk about some of the importance of yoga and what it can do for you in your life. By Kriya Yoga, I don't mean physical yoga. I mean meditative yoga. So that's that. Then we have technique number eight, which is contemplation using a journal. I also have an episode about that. How to contemplate using a journal. Go check that episode out. But specifically what you'd be doing here is you'd be contemplating your various specific macro and micro fears. You would be contemplating what this fear is and why it's arising for you. Where it came from. Why are you really afraid of it? What function is it serving in your life? How is it connecting back to your identity, to your ego, to your self-image? This sort of contemplative work is very good, and it helps to use a journal to, to keep you grounded and on a track. I will give you a warning here, though, is that contemplation alone is not going to be enough to conquer your fear. It's an important step. I would even say it's necessary to contemplate your macro fears and micro fears. But just contemplating them is not going to be enough. Fear is too powerful to allow you to just contemplate your way out of it. You can't just reason your way out of fear. That's sort of the whole point. Fear is prior to reasoning. But still, reasoning about it can help. Method number nine is the Sedona method or the letting go technique. I have an episode called The Power of Letting Go where I explain this technique in some detail and I give you a lot of examples. As simple as this technique is, don't underestimate how powerful it is. I think this is one of the most powerful techniques for dealing with fear in your everyday life. All this technique requires is that you feel the fear, identify the fear, and then just literally let it go in the present moment. And you keep doing that and doing that and doing that and doing that every single day for years on end, and this will completely transform uh, your relationship to fear and other emotions, but specifically we're talking about fear here. So this is such a powerful method. Like, for example, if you're doing pickup and you're going to bars and clubs and you're talking to girls and, you know, you're, you're getting that approach anxiety right before you go approach a girl. So try, try the letting go technique. Like right before you're about to approach a girl, feel that fear and then just let it go and then go do the approach and just keep doing that, doing that, doing that over and over and over again. And you'll see it makes a big difference. Or, for example, let's say you have creative anxiety. You're an artist or you're a musician, and every morning you, you, know, you get to work, you sit down at your computer or whatever, at your workstation, and, but you have this creative anxiety. What do you do? Feel into that creative anxiety and then use that method that I taught you in the Power of Letting Go episode and just let it go. And keep doing that over and over and over again every single day until you have a significant change. It's going to take a lot of work to do it, but eventually you'll be able to use this technique to let it go. And then you'll get so good at this letting go technique that, of course, you'll use it not just for fear and not just in this one specific situation, but you'll be able to expand this technique out. It's going to become a universal technique, which you can use for uh, fear of public speaking, for fear in the workplace, fear in your relationship, fear of... Mm, bad stuff happening to your family, etc. You'll, you'll expand it out. And then, of course, you'll also expand it out beyond fear to include anger and other negative emotions that you have. Technique number 10 is breathing. Breathing consciously, slowly and deeply as you feel your fear. So this technique is nice in that it can dovetail with some of the other techniques that we've mentioned above. So, for example, let's go with that example of you're getting up in front of a, a group of people to deliver your public speech. 
a Toastmasters, let's say. You feel into that fear, you feel it, but normally what would happen is that your body would lock up and you would not typically breathe consciously. So here you're going to remember to consciously breathe. Just like that. And you might even close your eyes. And you might literally do that right as you're standing up there, right about to deliver your speech. Everybody is looking at you. And normally, you know, you would be sort of put on the spot by all those eyes staring at you, expecting you to speak. But here, what you would do is you would pause and you would just give yourself the time to just to do that in, right in front of your audience. Let them see it. Do that. And then as you do that, also relax your body. Notice the various tension held in your arms and your legs and so forth. That's a very powerful technique. And you can practice that, of course, not just when you're public speaking. You can practice it in your car when you're going to work. Let's say you have an important meeting with your boss and you're anxious about it. Just practice that when you're in your car at the, at the red light waiting for it to turn green. That will help you. And for more about becoming mindful of your body, see my episode called Body Awareness, where I talk about being more conscious of your body. That's a, that's a very powerful method. Very simple, but very powerful and effective because fear is physiological. It's a physiological response. It's something your body is doing. You have to become much more mindful about the tension in, in your stomach muscles. That holds a lot of fear. Various tension in, in your arms and your hands. What you do with your fingers, your palms, how they sweat because you hold them like this when you're afraid. Or what you're doing with your legs. That's, that's a great, great method. Combine it with the other ones that I mentioned above. Just from having done that exercise right now, already my body feels a little bit more at ease than it was. My mind is a little bit slower. I'm talking a little bit slower. It's kind of calmed me down. It's kind of grounded me. So just training yourself to do slow and conscious breathing when you're talking with people, when you're talking with clients, when you're at school, right before a test. Very great stuff. Technique number 11 for dealing with fear is visualization and law of attraction. So, one way to deal with fear is to simply crowd it out of your mind with positivity. Overwhelm the fear with a positive vision. So, let's say right now you're having a difficulty paying the bills. You're in a tough spot in your life. You need money. You're scared. You're worried. You don't know where you're going to get a job, where the money's going to come from, how you're going to make ends meet. So one option you have is to keep going down that negative spiral. You can keep visualizing it. You can keep telling yourself how bad it is and how horrible it is and how no one's going to hire you and how all this job interview that you went to, they're probably not going to call you back and et cetera. And of course, this would just create a negative spiral. And you will just fear more. And then out of this fear, you will make bad decisions. The other possibility is that you catch yourself and you stop yourself and you recognize that, wait a minute. Yes, my situation right now isn't good. I need to figure out how to fix this. But also, worrying about it here and having all this negative imagery is not going to work. Let me come up with a positive vision. Let me start to visualize how I'm going I'm to get a job. And it's not just going to be a bad job. It's going to be a great job. And this job is going to have great great prospects for the future. And maybe two years from now, I can visualize myself, you know, living in a nice apartment and being able to pay all my bills ahead of time and not having to suffer through this ever again in my life, having a lot of money in my bank account. And I can visualize myself having a nice car and I can visualize myself um, mm, buying the stuff that I want to buy and being able to afford it. And so if you do this kind of visualization consistently, this is a very good way of just crowding out your mind because your mind is only thinking of one thing at a time. 
If you're thinking of negative stuff, that's what you're thinking about, negative stuff. And you're feeling negative. If you're thinking about positive stuff, you're feeling positive. You can't hold a negative and a positive thought or feeling in your head or in your body at the same time. So the trick, though, with visualization, and I do have a video, old video about visualization. Go check that out. Explains how to do the technique. Is that you got to do it daily. A little bit of it goes a long way, but you have to do it daily. So you don't need to visualize for an hour. You can just visualize for five or ten minutes on whatever thing you fear. So, for example, if you fear approaching beautiful women, visualize yourself for five minutes before you go out approaching beautiful women and that it goes great and that they love you and they are responsive and they give you dates and all the stuff that you want. Visualize that and you'll notice that helps. If you're afraid of talking to your boss about getting a raise, what do you do? Sit down and visualize for a week before you go talk to your boss. Every single day for five or ten minutes, just visualize yourself talking to your boss and he listens to you, he's receptive, and he gives you a raise. And then the whole situation works well. Visualize that. Now, of course, you're going to wonder, well, Leo, but what happens if I do visualize that and then I do go to my boss and it goes terribly? Haven't I just been fooling myself with these positive visions? You haven't been fooling yourself. You've been programming yourself. See? Using these visualization techniques does not mean that your life will always go however you want. That's not the point of it. The point of it is that you're increasing your chances and you're also making yourself feel good while you do this. So rather than spending a week worrying about how your boss is going to reject you, instead you spend a week visualizing how he's going to actually like your proposal and maybe will give you a higher position and a higher salary. Now, is there a chance that he won't? Yes, but dwelling on that chance and worrying about that chance that he will reject you, um, that's not going to help you. That's going to make you feel like a victim. In fact, if you think that way, you probably will be too afraid to even ever go talk to him. But if you program yourself for a week with positivity, then you'll have more confidence, you'll have more pep in your step when you go in there, you'll have a bigger smile, you'll have a more positive expectation. You might even have some ideas throughout that week of what kind of things you should say to him that will that will work as you're visualizing, you know, in that visualization process, you're gonna ideas will come to you. Positive ideas, empowering ideas will come to you, and then you can use those to create the kind of situation that you want. So in this way, you're being a proactive creator of your life rather than just sitting back and letting life happen to you. And that's empowering. And uh, that's a great way to combat fear. Takes a bit of work, though. Most of these methods take a bit of work, which is why most people don't do them. Most people are just lazy and complacent, and they just want to be fearless automatically. Well, you know what? Guess what? It doesn't happen that way. In life, if you want to be fearless, you're going to have to work for it. And the final method, number 12, is love. Love is, you might say, the polar opposite of fear. Love is the ultimate solution to fear. Whatever situation in life that you're in, where you're scared, the most counterintuitive you can move, you can make at that point, is to practice and experience love in that situation. But that's a, a rather tricky topic. In fact, I'm going to have a separate episode in the future about how to do this. So I'm just throwing this out there for you now as a bit of a teaser, because there's a lot to say about how love and fear interrelate, and we've still only scratched the surface of this topic here. But a few ideas about love here, so you can start to practice it a bit, is first of all, gratitude. Be grateful and more appreciative of life and all of the opportunities and situations that you find yourself in. This is a form of love. Gratitude is a form of love. And the more loving and conscious you become, the more grateful you're, you're going to become about just your ordinary, everyday life. 
the people in your life, the situation that you're in, even your financial situation, you know, you can be grateful for it. When you're feeling gratitude in your heart, there is no room at the same time for fear. So you can have a gratitude practice where you spend five or 10 minutes every morning just being grateful, going through the things that you're grateful for in your life and actually feeling it in your heart. That's one way. Another way to practice love is through selfless service. So when you're feeling most afraid, do something selfless for another person. At your job, through your business, through your life purpose work, or just help somebody. Help somebody in your family, help a friend. Because, see, the whole problem with fear is that it's selfishness incarnated. What's the solution to selfishness? Selflessness. This is why having a powerful life purpose is so effective for grounding your life. Because your life purpose is the selfless service that you're doing for the world. And that ultimately is coming out of love. Selfless service is not done as an obligation. I'm not telling you to go work at a soup kitchen because you have to. I'm saying find some way in your own life where your, your work, what you're doing with your work and with your time is contributing to the betterment of mankind in a way that you find meaningful and that you believe in. And that is your expression of love for mankind and for yourself and for the universe. And if you want a really detailed explanation of how all that works, well, for that, you have to go check out my Ultimate Life Purpose course, where we have over 25 hours of explanation of videos of how to do all that. By the way, I should, I should mention here, I don't, I, don't, I don't really upsell my Life Purpose course enough. Um, I think most people underestimate this. All the content in my Life Purpose course, it's about 25 hours of video. All of that content is totally unique, brand new content that you've never seen on the main channel or in the free material. Totally new content, new ideas, new concepts that I've never talked about. So when you pay something to me for my work, when you buy a course from me, Understand that you're always going to get new content. It's not going to be just a rehash of the same old stuff I've talked about. It's going to be deliberate stuff that I've reserved for that course so that you're getting your money's worth. And anyone who's paid the 250 bucks for this course and has gone through all of it, you get your money's worth. You see, you feel how much work was put into that course. A lot of work was put into that course, way more than anyone puts into a $250 course. And that course will pay for itself a hundred times, a thousand times over throughout the rest of your life if you take it seriously and you do it seriously. So go check that out. Anyways, those are the 12 techniques that I know of that I think are the most effective for dealing with fear. Now, let's move on to a sort of a different subtopic here, which is the following. Notice that knowing somebody's fear allows you to predict their behavior. If you really want to understand why people do the things they do, whether as individuals or collectively, study their fears. What do they fear? Get inside their mind and try to figure it out. And if you can figure that out, that gives you enormous power. Now, of course, power can be used for good or for evil. So in this case, if you know somebody's fears, you can predict their behavior. This allows you to help them, or this allows you to manipulate them and to exploit them. Now, of course, I don't recommend going the second route. <clears throat> As an example of this, uh, I bring up Vladimir Putin again, the president of Russia. <clears throat> so there was a news story about a year or two ago where... <clears throat> Putin had a meeting with Angela Merkel, uh, the chancellor of Germany. And apparently, it's well known about Angela Merkel that she has a fear of dogs. Because I don't know why it is, but I think she was like 
bitten by a dog when she was young. And so now everyone knows she has a fear of dogs. And Putin, in this meeting, deliberately brought his, like, aggressive-looking <laughs> dog with him to the meeting. Because, of course, what he was trying to do is he was trying to exploit and manipulate this fear that she had of dogs. Now, this is a textbook definition of devilry. So I don't recommend you do that. And uh, the reason I don't recommend you do this is because when you manipulate people's fears to meet your own survival needs, what this does is it creates bad karma. Devilry always creates bad karma. Devilry comes back to bite you in the ass. It's going to create suffering for you if you act in a way that you're trying to manipulate people's fears all the time. So I don't recommend that you go down this road. In fact, uh, I recommend that you do the opposite. I recommend that you seek to alleviate other people's fears. Get into the habit of assessing other people's fears. For example, you can do this exercise. Sit down with a piece of paper and ask yourself, brainstorm, what does your mother fear? What does your father fear? What does your spouse fear? What does your boss fear? What does your company fear? What does your client or your patient fear? What do scientists fear? What do Christians fear? What do Muslims fear? What do spiritual people fear? What do atheists fear? And so on and so on. In fact, I'll have a worksheet for you that you can go and click the link down below this video to download this worksheet, which has a bunch of questions. It's like an exercise that you go through and you contemplate all these different possible fears that people have. And what this does is it helps you to step into their shoes and look at the world from their point of view. And as you do that, that helps to explain in your own mind why these people behave the way they behave why they believe what they believe, why they hold the ideologies that they hold. And then, in this way, you can become really good at understanding other people. You can learn to communicate with others in a powerful and effective way by thinking through their fears and then coming up with solutions to their fears and then communicating the solutions to their fears. In this way, you can become a powerful leader. You can develop a, a powerful business. In the end, what is business? Business is figuring out what is the fear of your client or what is something that people fear in the world and then coming up with a solution to that. And that requires being able to see the world from their point of view. Like, you might ask the question, what do most parents fear? And one of the answers you might get is like, well, they fear their child getting kidnapped. Okay, and then you can ask yourself the next question. Well, if I want to start a business for parents to give them solutions to parents, I could just take like the top five fears of parents and develop technologies or solutions for that. So if, if the top fear of parents is that their child will get kidnapped, or maybe the, top, the second top fear is that their child will get shot up in school because of these school shootings we keep having. What kind of technology could I develop? Some gadget or some website or whatever to help with that. And if I can come up with a good solution, then I know it's going to resonate with those people because people are motivated by their fears. Now, again, of course, you can, you can do this in a positive way. You can do this in a negative way. You can start a business that exploits people's fears. Like, for example, you can start a business. You might ask yourself, well, like, what do conservatives fear in America? Well, they fear brown people. So I can come up with a business that you know, fear mongers to conservatives that brown people are invading America and then I can sell them more guns. Well, that would also be a business. But again, remember, like I said, when you're playing up to people's fears and you're fear mongering to people, um, this ultimately is going to come back and bite you in the ass. So it's not a good idea to go down that road. Rather, inspire people. Be an entrepreneur or a business person. Have a sense of life purpose that inspires people, that helps them to cope with their fears in a healthy way that doesn't 
exploit their fears. If you want to be able to build rapport quickly with people, maybe with clients, for example, get good at asking them about their fears. And a good question to ask them is, hey, what keeps you up at night? And see what they tell you. Like if you're a doctor and you want to understand your patients better, next patient you talk to, ask them, what keeps you up at night about your health? And watch them talk. They're going to spill all the beans to you because no one's ever asked them that question. It's a very powerful question. Or if you're in a relationship with your spouse, ask them, what keeps you up at night? What are you afraid of? What are your biggest fears about our relationship? Oh boy, that's a powerful question. It's going to open a whole can of worms. See? But to ask this question, you have to be really interested. You have to want to know the other person's point of view, and you also have to be able to take their fears seriously. Remember, the fears they have might seem ridiculous to you. Like if you ask a Christian, what's your biggest fear? They might have some fears that are silly to you, but they're real to them. Are you willing to listen? Are you willing to understand? See, by exposing yourself and understanding other people's fears, what this will do is this will expose you to the selfishness of your own fears. Because you'll see that all these different groups of people have their own unique fears, and you'll see how limited and selfish these fears are and how ridiculous they are, which will help you to see your own fears as selfish and limited and ridiculous. So this ability to understand and deal with fear and communicate about fear is very important if you're interested in good leadership. And I have a a pretty nice episode about how leadership works, how to be a leader. Go search for that. So we're getting towards the end now. And in conclusion, I just want to say that there is no magic trick to overcoming fear. That's what your whole life is for, really. Your whole life is for facing yourself, for facing the universe. Remember, the universe is you. You fear you, ultimately. You fear your own infinite scope. You are literally so awesome that you're scary. That's what consciousness is doing. Consciousness is figuring out how to grapple with its own enormity. And the paradox is this. The paradox about fear is that your whole life you think that you're afraid of various bad parts of life because they're dangerous and scary and evil. But ultimately what you discover is the shocking truth is that what you really feared the whole time was not bad and evil stuff, but rather what you really feared is the realization that there is no such thing as bad or evil at all, and that all of it is infinite love. And what you really fear is dissolving into that love because that love is so infinite and so indiscriminate that it leaves no room for your little limited ego and for your little petty attachments. And that's what you're really afraid of. You're not afraid of evil. You're afraid of love. Love is the scariest thing. Love is the most radical thing. That's the paradox of all this. This topic of fear is central to your life. You will come back to it again and again and again all throughout this work, all throughout your life at ever deeper levels. So avoiding this topic of fear, avoiding this work is really unwise. It will have disastrous results in your life. Why does avoidance of fear not work? Because in the end, the truth is that everything is one. Reality is singular. The universe is singular. You are the universe, and you cannot avoid yourself forever. That's why life happens as it happens. That's why you're always being pushed. And that's why you're always afraid, because you're being pushed to realize and explore more and more of yourself, but you're so big that it threatens you. It threatens your old, limited self. 
you're being pushed to expand into infinity. See, but you're too afraid to expand too quickly. But the truth is that you're the whole thing. So you can't keep yourself bottled up forever in your little limited identity. Your limited identity will ultimately collapse. Whether you do it consciously or unconsciously, whether you do it in your 20s, in your 30s, or in your 70s and 80s when you're on your deathbed, in the end, your limited identity must collapse. And the truth of oneness must prevail. So this division that you made between yourself and others, this splitting of like, I'm over here, I'm one, and they're over there, that's number two, and one, number one is separate from number two, this sort of divisiveness, this is falsehood, this is illusion. This must ultimately come to an end. And what must prevail is total unity. And it's this total unity that you're terrified of that you've labeled death. The surest way to fail at life is to allow yourself to be crippled by fear. And to not be bold, but to be meek. And to make choices that are run by fear. And to succumb to your own fears. That's the surest way to fail in your relationships, in your career, in your business, in your health, in your personal life. Life is all about exploration of yourself. When you're driving to some beautiful national park and you're looking at the trees and the mountains, what are you doing? You're not just exploring the earth. You're really exploring your own self. The entire earth is yourself. As you see different parts of yourself, you take it in. Sometimes it's something beautiful, sometimes it's something ugly and hideous, but all of it is you. And to take all that in requires, and here I'm delivering on the thing, other thing I promised you in part one, which is the answer to the question of, what is the most important quality you need to succeed in life? It's fearlessness. What you need is fearlessness. That's how you live the good life. If you said, rather than fearlessness, love or courage or consciousness, those are all synonymous with fearlessness. To be fearless is to be loving is to be accepting of everything, is the same as having courage, is the same as having consciousness. Imagine what would happen in your relationships, in your business, in your career, with your finances, if you were fearless. Imagine if you were bold and courageous with your life decisions. If you had a strong vision that you said yes to every single morning, there you go. And why are you struggling in life? Why are not you, you receiving the kind of results that you want? It's because you're scared. It's because life is big. It's challenging. It's scary. It's overwhelming. It's so huge sometimes that you don't even know where to begin. You're overwhelmed in your relationship. You're overwhelmed with the prospect of starting a business, you're overwhelmed by the prospect of finding your life purpose, or you're overwhelmed by spiritual work. You're afraid of taking a psychedelic, you're afraid of meditation, you're afraid of this, you're afraid of that, you're afraid of going back to school, you're afraid of getting into this relationship, you're afraid of talking to that girl, you're afraid of confessing your feelings to that guy. You see the problem? Life needs to be lived bold. Now you might say, well, but Leo, if I live life bold, I might die. It might be dangerous and risky. Yes, that's life. Fearlessness doesn't really mean that you never experience the feeling of fear. Fearlessness means more so that you experience the fear, but you don't succumb to it. You don't let it despirit you. You don't let it change your decision. So like, for example, when I started my first business, I was scared to start it. It was risky. It was dangerous. 
And yet, despite that, I started it anyways. That's what counts as fearlessness. See? When you see some cute girl at the grocery store and you want to go talk to her, it's okay if you have fear, but you push yourself to go talk to her anyways. That's still fearlessness. What's true fearfulness is when you have that fear, but then you say, oh, well, then I shouldn't go talk to her at all. That's when you've succumbed to your fear. And in that situation, that's when your life starts to go downhill. So there you go. That's one of the keys to life. Um, just as a final reminder, as homework for you, you can download the worksheet below, do that, and also remember to keep doing that daily observation work of daily observing your fear, feeling that fear. Observe how fear runs your whole life. Do a couple of years of just observation work to get started here, right? Because this is going to pay dividends for you for the rest of your life. I'm telling you, if you can figure out how fear works at an existential level, that's going to be so valuable for you for, for all situations. Can you see how universal this skill is? It's not just going to help you in one situation. It's going to help you in all situations across the board. So if you understand that, then you should understand that this is really a practice that's worth investing some time and energy into. It's going to pay itself off. All right, that's it. I'm done here. Please come check out my website. Well, first of all, click the like button for me. That helps the videos. Then come check out my website. That's actualize.org. You'll find exclusive content on my blog. You'll find the forum. You'll find a life purpose course. You'll find the book list where um, you can use those to, to help you in various ways. Stuff that's not available in my ordinary free YouTube videos. And the last thing I'll say is this. Mastering your emotions is the hardest part of this work. Mastering your emotions is harder than waking up. There's, of course, some overlap between the two. Waking up helps you to master your emotions. And conversely, mastering your emotions helps you to wake up. People who have not master their emotions at all, cannot wake up. But usually waking up is not enough to automatically have all of your emotions mastered. This requires more work. So really, we want to be doing both simultaneously. Do some work to wake up and do some work to master your emotions. Don't rely on one or the other to fix the other. And be very patient with yourself here. This is a lifetime's work. This is not something you're not going to master your emotions in one year. We're talking decades here to really truly master your emotions significantly. But also, you know, you're going to make progress. So you don't have to wait for 10 years to get the fruits of this work. You're going to be getting little bits of this work every week as you're doing it. But also... You know, be be patient. Understand this is a long-term process, a long-term investment into your life. Don't worry if you don't know how you're going to master all of your emotions yet. You don't need to know how. Just start doing the practices and start sort of like eating this elephant one little piece at a time. Right now, we're working on fear. In the future, we'll work on anger or we'll work on jealousy or we'll work on sadness and depression, or we'll work on loneliness. There's a lot of different components to emotions. Fear is just one aspect of it here. It's a very big, important aspect. Um, but uh, be patient with yourself. This is what your whole life is about, really, is figuring out how to understand all of your emotions and how to make sure that they're not running you anymore, so that you're acting out of consciousness and wisdom rather than just like a puppet, a marionette controlled by strings, which are usually emotions for people. So as we go forward with Actualize.org, I will have more content, more videos, and even courses probably in the future, which will help you to master your emotions.